best time of my life is when I'm with students, with young people. So I'm very happy for you. Put your hands together for yourself. Mr. President of the Student Union Government, Executive of the Student Union Government, Representative of the Academic Staff Association, Director and Staff of the Anti-Corruption Commission, Dignitaries representing various institutions here present, Students, I greet you all. We are here to talk about a topic which is usually taboo. People don't want to talk about it. Lawyers cringe when they hear about it. Certainly, people wonder whether in fact it should be something to discuss. Well, you see, my role is to work with young people to discuss those things that are taboo, to open their minds to them. And that is why when I was invited to speak here to lecture on an interesting topic, we and the Student Union government agreed that this was a suitable topic to discuss. Now, before I start, let me see who are the political science students or general students here. Put your hands up. And let me see the law students. There is a battle of supremacy between law and politics that has gone on for years. And sometimes it is difficult to determine which one is supreme over the other. Because all of them have enormous power. They were created for a purpose. I have always said design has a purpose. So, when politics was created by mankind some 800,000 years ago, for us to govern ourselves so that we do not kill ourselves, so that society is orderly, it was by design. And that is why we have leadership everywhere. It does not matter where, there has to be some form of leadership. So politics has been with us for as much as we have been human. But similarly, once politics was created to govern human affairs, there was the need for society to be orderly. I'm sure the political science students know exactly what Hugo Grutus said about society without law and order. Not so? Can anybody remind us? It will be what? Brutish and nasty. None of us will want to live there because it will be the typical situation of survival of the fittest. It will be a jungle. So, by this answer you have given to me, what created what? Don't be shy. We are having a conversation. What created what? Was it law that created politics or was it politics that created law? So, we agree that politics created law. Not so? So, if one of them was going to be the father, which one would that be? Politics would be the father. So, that brings me to a very interesting conversation that we should have. If something is created for a purpose by another, can we say that thing is entirely independent of that which created it? Don't be shy, I have said. We are having a conversation. So, when we lawyers pride ourselves, when we say judicial independence, what do we mean? What are we talking about? You see, 
What exactly constitutes judicial independence has often generated scholarly debates among political scientists and lawyers. Many have argued that the concept does not exist in the sense that lawyers believe it, i.e., an independent court that applies laws fairly and justly between litigants before it at every given time without external control. That is what lawyers understand judicial independence to be, not so? So when we say that we want the law to be, we are independent, that is what we mean. It is called a triad, a triadic dispute resolution system. An independent judge who sits and you have two litigants before it, and the judge has no interest or control whatsoever. And the judge is supposed to determine the issues before him as they come. No politics, no consideration for the president, no consideration for any other person, no consideration for the judge himself. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. The various literature on the issue examine the concept on both autocratic regimes and regimes that are not autocratic. So the question we ask ourselves, you see everywhere there are two kinds of regime, no matter how you look at it. Either it is autocratic, that means there is one person or a body of people who exact enormous control and power, or you have a situation where it is more pluralistic, like we have multi-party democracy in the US, in Sierra Leone, and other countries. So, what I am going to do here with you is for us to examine the question of judicial independence in both regimes. And we are going to conclude by answering the questions to ourselves. In all of these regimes, whether it is autocratic, whether it is democratic, is there really judicial independence in the circumstances and situation as lawyers believe it to exist? I see everybody is getting sad. Don't be sad. Smile. What I believe really when we say there is judicial independence is not really independence. Judicial independence is a myth. It's a facade. It's a mirage. It does not exist. What really we mean when we talk about judicial independence is autonomy. There is a difference between autonomy and independence. Autonomy is where you can do your day-to-day -day activities and actions without somebody controlling you. So when we say the ACC is independent, it does not mean the ACC is a republic of its own. It means the commissioner can wake up in the morning, take a decision with his staff to investigate a particular institution without waiting for state house to call the commissioner. That is autonomy. And in judicial independence, it's the same. The judge can write a ruling without having to call somebody to dictate it for him or her. So, let us first of all disabuse our minds from the fact of judicial independence. It does not exist. It's a mirage. It's a facade. But why do we pride ourselves to have it? Let's take, for example, judicial independence in non-democratic states. There was Egypt. Egypt has had several autocratic regimes over the years. But a phenomenon developed in Egypt. The courts were given decisions that went against the interest of the regime in power. The judges appeared to be very independent. So it was easy for political scientists to map out why there will be judicial independence, for example, in the US and other places. But Egypt became a phenomenon. The question was being asked, particularly after 1979 coming to 1997, 
Why does Egypt have autocratic regimes? But the political situation is such that the judges can rule. Civil society will just wake up and file against the, the actions of the military that it is illegal, and the judges will say it is illegal. The military. When it was dug, when it was dug to find out what is happening, it found out that the reason why this was happening in Egypt was that in 1952, when Gamal Abdel Nasser became head of state in Egypt after overthrowing the royalty, what did he do? He went on what we call expropriation. Those who studied Egyptian history, he was taking over businesses that belonged to people, foreign companies, everything. That is the time they nationalized the Suez Canal and said it now belongs to Egypt. If you want, go and, go, go and, go and plead to God. Do we understand? So, when Abdel Gamal Nasser died in 1978, there was a new president who came. The president wanted to cleanse Egypt of this idea that it is a state that expropriates. It's a state that seizes people's property. It's a state that has no respect for people's rights and laws. So it became a core commitment of the Egyptian state to ensure that people have rights and freedoms, particularly to attract investment into Egypt once again. Are we following? So the best way for that to be achieved is to allow the judiciary to do what it has to do. So basically the judiciary was appearing to be independent, but what was it doing? It was doing the bidding of the government. Do we understand? It was a core commitment of the regime in Egypt to ensure that people go to court and say it is my property and they say yes, it is your property. Because that is the only way they will be seen to be moving away from the actions of Abdel Gamal Nasser and to enter a new system. But when you look at that in Egypt, you still find out that issues that had to do with security, for example, sometimes the judges will not even rule around it. They'll just ignore it. You go to court 500 times, you lose 500 times. Because in every society, there is what we call the red line. The red line is usually the core commitment of the regime. If a judge touches the core commitment of the regime, the judges will have what we call retaliation. Retaliation is when, for example, they can push the court. They can easily just make you useless. You are there and they appoint. There are, there are 15 Supreme Court judges and they just appoint another 15. And now you are sitting down in your office and there is no file coming your way. It is this new 15 who can decide the cases. Nobody will ask you questions. They pay you salaries at the end of the month. Sometimes there is direct retaliation. And we are going to see that when we move to Zimbabwe. In line with this, there was Uganda and Zimbabwe. Both of them had despots, not so? Everybody knows Robert Mugabe, not so? Yes. And so too, everybody knows Yuweri Museveni. He has been president since 1986, and he's still there today. Robert Mugabe could not even stay awake anymore, but wanted to remain president until they said, no, pa, this one, you have to go. But there was a phenomenon in these two countries that attracted political scientists. When Mugabe came to power, he came to power on the premise of expropriating land. Not so. Give land to black people. Not so. The courts in Zimbabwe started ruling against Mugabe. So everybody was happy. 
I can go to court. We have Mugabe and the courts we are ruling against Mugabe. What is happening here? The same thing. In Uganda, there was and there still is a very powerful opposition leader called Kiza Besije. Besije has been a thorn in Yuweri Museveni's flesh for so long. So, definitely on the instruction of Yuweri Museveni, Besije was arrested several times. And sometimes they don't want to give him bail. The judges would order the release of Kiza Besije. In fact, there was a time when the court had to be invaded by the Black Mamba. The Black Mamba are the very powerful security support system to, to, to Yuweri Museveni in Uganda. Now, again, political scientists are asking, how are these judges doing this? How are they independent? The whole idea behind this kind of independence is that even though the political system created judges to be independent, created the courts to be independent, for them to appear to be independent, not really for them to be fully independent, because it is in their interest for them to remain independent, they are still watching them. This is not limited to Africa. In Mexico, it's the same. Before the year 2000, there was a series of regimes called the PRI regimes. These regimes were basically there to ensure that there is social control. The same thing in Turkey. Before the current president, there was a non-majoritarian political system in Turkey, whereby they wanted to maintain the secular system in the country. So they didn't want Muslims to take over Turkey. To maintain their power, they relied on the judiciary to do so. And of course, the judiciary would do it. What I am leading to is to open your minds to something. You see, when we think about judicial independence, when we think about what judges do, we have to understand that they are human beings They operate within a political system. And in that political system, there are various constraints tied to them. So, what do we say then was happening in Uganda, in Zimbabwe, in Egypt, in Mexico, in Turkey? For example, let me tell you when Mugabe got fed up with the courts. Okay? Their independence is guaranteed just like we have in Sierra Leone. They are not subject to anybody's control and everything. And then they started going against the core commitment of Robert Mugabe. He said, when I come, I am going to take land from white people and give it to black people. Not so. When the Zimbabwe court started saying, This is quoted as being said by Mugabe in the African affairs. It is called Mugabe's Mayhem in the year 2000. He said, the courts are saying nonsense. It will never happen that blacks should fight each other. I will die with my claim to land. My right to land is a claim which cannot be compromised. It is our right, it is our land, we must be prepared to die for it. So, when the judges started interfering with Mugabe's core commitment to land, what did he do? He attacked them. Some of them had to flee to South Africa. Some of them were forced to resign. Some of them were put in prison. And then, as they did, he started replacing them with people who could listen to him. People who he does not even have to talk to, and they give rulings in his favor. That is the reality of judicial independence. So, all of this goes to say it does not matter what regime we have. The positivists have always said it right. And what did they say? Those of you who did 
introduction to jurisprudence year one. Code, principle, plugins, leggings, habits, vigorous. That which pleases the king has the force of law. Were you told this in year one? You are told this in final year? It is the foundation of positivism. John Austin is quoted as saying it, but it goes way beyond the days of Cole Austin. It was even ascribed to Hammurabi in the Bible. One of the wicked kings. That which pleases the king has the force of law. Code, principle, plagit. Legis, habit, vigorum. Therefore, the wishes of the ruler is always significant to what will be judicial independence in the country. Whether in a democracy or in an autocracy, can we say judicial independence exists? We have to look at it from the point that courts are only independent as the ruling coalition allows them to remain. I want you law students and political scientists to keep this in your mind. Courts are only as independent as the ruling coalition allows them to remain. Now you will ask yourself, who are the ruling coalition? Israelis, who are the ruling coalition? Who are the ruling coalition? You'll be surprised that it's not just the ruling party. You'll be surprised that it's not just the executive body. The ruling coalition are a combination of people. They are very powerful. In Sierra Leone, they are principally found in the APC and the SLPP. If you think, if you think that because the APC is in opposition, they are not part of the ruling coalition, you are making a dangerous mistake. Just look at what is happening in parliament, for example. When parliament decided against Honor Gebau, who are the ones who said it should happen? Was it just SLPP? It's a ruling coalition. So whether SLPP is out of power, or SLPP is in power, or APC is out of power, or APC is out of power, the ruling coalition will remain the ruling coalition. And it is they who decide how independent the judicial system should be. These are things we have to understand. Courts are only as independent as the ruling coalition allows them to remain. Martin Shapiro tries to present this clearly. When he wrote the following, Martin Shapiro is the father of the study of courts. He is the man, he is like our own Jesus Christ. He studied courts in such a way and understood courts in such a way that what he said about courts is, 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 is Bible for political scientists. And he said, in the most basic and usually the least important sense, Independence would mean that the judge had not been bribed or was not in some other way a dependent of one of the parties. So what really we call judicial independence is not because a decision is taken without interference. It's because we say the judge has not been bribed. Nobody has come and meet him at night and say, yes, sir, look, 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 envelope. Also, in addition to that, what we call judicial independence is when the judge really does not have any interest with the parties before him. But Shapiro went on to say, when we ensure this kind of independence by creating the office of a judge within the government structure, in a far more important sense, he is not independent. For he is a dependent for those whom he holds office. Have you gone in High Court number one in Sierra Leone? Where the judge sits, like Mr. Sandin sitting there, on top of his head. 
is the crown of the state. So when you go to court and you stand there, Joseph C. Say against the state. And the judge is sitting down under the crown of the state. <laughs> Do you think it is a triad? Do you think it's a three-way judgment? It's two against one. <laughs> so, now this is where it gets interesting for you. All John Cissé can pray for is one thing. That his case is such that Number one, the judge has no interest himself. <laughs> Do we understand? The judge does not care. And the judge's interest includes other people's interests which he represents. So, if there is some uncle who called that judge in the morning, just to say he's in trouble. These are the situations that we look at. Autonomy is a function of control by the rulers and not the lack of it. By this, courts derive their power and autonomy from the ruling coalition. A more plural, diverse coalition usually leads to a more independent court due to the fragmentation of sources of power of the court. In a society that is more pluralistic, like I started by saying that there are two kinds of society, not so. There is the autocratic society where power is concentrated probably in one man or a body of people. Not so. But there are also times when you have a society where power is fragmented. Judges have power. Civil society have power. Journalists have power. And there are power everywhere you look. Because of that, judges can look at the situation and draw power from some other source. So, for example, when the president appoints a judge, and that judge basically is doing things that favor the president, he will remain in power. The judge will be promoted. The judge will have various rewards. But there are times when if that judge deviates from the core commitment of the president and falls out of favor, that judge will be moved into another sphere. And in that sphere, a lot can happen. We have to understand that judicial independence is there. It is there. I am not saying it does not exist. I am not even saying that judges do not have will. I am not saying judges cannot take decisions without any interference. But when that decision touches the core commitment of the regime, that is where there is a problem. And no matter how you look at it, it does not matter. Let's look at the United States of America now. It is easy for us to say in autocratic regimes that judicial independence does not exist. But when we move to a more pluralistic society like the United States of America, it is difficult for us to do so. The difference is that, whilst in democracies, judges may have a wider sphere of latitude within which they can exercise their independence, as long as the exercise of such power does not touch the regime's guarded interest, referred to as Mustafa as the red line. There is a political scientist who call it the red line. There are some political scientists who call it the electric rail. Do you know what the electric rail is? Well, we have not really seen railways in Sierra Leone, but there are electric rails in other countries. If you touch it, it will shock you. Do you understand? You touch the electric rail, you will be shocked. Every political system has those electric rails deployed. It may be promises in manifestos. It may be just the core commitment of the state. Like Mugabe came and said, I am giving people land. 
like about robot, uh, like UAE Musuvedi is protecting the the those veterans who fought with him. It could be anything. It could be access to human rights. It could be the fight against corruption. If a judge decides to constantly touch that core commitment, that is the time you will know that judicial independence does not exist. But without that, the judge has latitude. Two people come before him, he can decide the regime is not interested. He can send you to prison for 50 years. That is your business. The difference is that these factors are present not only in known autocratic political systems, but even in prototype democratic systems like the United States of America or the United Kingdom. The only difference will be that the sphere of independence in democracies may be more elastic than in non-democracies. So you will find out that, for example, in the US, the things that are considered to be red tape will be very few, very small. And they change over time. So right now, I can speak with you. It will take madness for any judge in the US to rule against gay rights. But they have been ruling against it before. Do you think they just changed their minds? It will take madness for any judge to rule that slavery is right. But trust me, for 200 years, you should see the judgments that were coming out of the US Supreme Court. In fact, they were even dividing how somebody can amount to a white man or a black man. They will say, you are seven tenths black man. You are five foot black man. But today, nobody dares do that. Because now it is an electric rail. You touch it, you'll be burnt. The same thing happened. I recall when we are having conversation with my colleagues and friends, they are talking about human rights and all these things, and I asked them. The issue of Guantanamo Bay being a human rights abuse went to the Supreme Court, not so. Everybody knows what was happening at Guantanamo Bay, not so. There was torture going on there. Do you think the Supreme Court of US ever ruled that it was torture? Because after 9-11, such a ruling was an electric rail. So, this is what Robert Dahl, a very well-known philosopher. Those of you in final year, I don't know whether you've come across Robert Dahl. You should. He's a philosopher. This is what he said about the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not, however, simply an agent of alliance. It is an essential part of the political leadership and possesses some base of power of its own. The most important of which is the unique legitimate, the legitimacy attributed to its interpretation of the Constitution. This legitimacy, the court jeopardizes if it flagrantly opposes the major policies of the dominant alliance. Such a cause of action, as we have seen, is one in which the court will not normally be tempted to engage. This is somebody talking about the U.S. courts. They, they cannot go against the dominant alliance. In the U.S., there is always a dominant alliance. And I have told you, do not make the mistake of thinking that the dominant alliance is either Republican or Democrats. It can be a combination of both. If a judge goes against the wishes, the policies, the principles of that dominant alliance, He's in trouble. It does not matter where. Not many will disagree with the position that if prototype advanced democracy like the United States of America does not have absolute judicial independence, does anywhere have one? Under what conditions then do courts obtain authority and autonomy? We know already, as I have told you, that judicial independence does not exist. What we have is judicial autonomy. For them to be able to write their rulings without somebody dictating it for them. For them to be able to take decisions. But even their salaries are paid by the state. Are they not? Those of you who did government, who pays the judges? And what do we say in English? He who pays the piper? 
So why then do we find it difficult to understand these things? Because they are every day in our eyes. You see, the freedom of judges to rule sincerely according to judges' own legal and policy preferences. By most accounts, autonomy is primarily a product of contextual political conditions which might broadly be characterized as the fragmentation of the political arena, typically measured either by the number of relative size of the parties or by the degree of the executive control over the legislature. We can know if the political, if the political system is controlled by how much the executive can control the legislature. In the U.S., we know that it is very difficult. Not so. The legislation is very powerful. Not so. Can we say the same in Sierra Leone? That is where you know. Because judges are appointed by the president and they go for approval where? <laughs> Politicians are aware that judges are strategic actors. Politicians are aware that judges are strategic actors. And so the focus tends to be on the possibility of acting post-appointment to punish or reward judges for their decisions. We should always ask ourselves when determining judicial independence, what cost a judge will incur if they always act sincerely. Let's ask ourselves that every time we look at judges. Let's ask ourselves, if this man is sincerely looking at things and calling them as they are, what is the cost to him? Will he get promoted the next time coming? Will he become Chief Justice? Will he have all the cases going to him? These are the questions we ask ourselves to determine independence. Promotions and punishment, malignment or porch, these are the instruments that are used against them. Judges ask themselves these questions I've asked you more than you know. When they are writing decisions, they ask themselves, if I do this decision sincerely and it goes against the interest of the regime, will I maintain my position and power? And you political scientists know what that means. Because what do we say is the first rule of existence? Self-preservation. And a man who is focused on self-preservation cannot be independent. Therefore, we have to understand that there are ex-ante and ex-post Restraints that are on judges, that are uncovered by politicians, by politics, that makes it difficult for them to be able to really do that which we lawyers want them to do. We have to understand this. We want them to be fair people. And most times they themselves want to be fair. They want to take decisions that are in the best interest of everybody. They may not be bribed. There may be nothing that they have done. But there are constraints. And because judges are strategic actors, there is a limit to what they can do. There is also the element of compliance. No judge wants to give a ruling that is not enforced. No judge wants to say, I am giving a ruling that that property should be seized, and somebody says, now you know you talk. If a judge has that at the back of his mind, that judge, that alone is a constraint by itself. And it will not be judges themselves who are going down to execute. Not so. When they go to execute, take people's houses, throw out their things, do you see judges there? No. So, if judges understand or believe that their rulings and decisions will not be enforced, they will not be able to function independently. And most times, that is a constraint by itself. You see, also the political system can create systems of judicial recruitment, training, organization, and promotion 
that ensures that the judge will be relatively neutral as between two purely private parties, but will be the absolute faithful servant of the regime on all legal matters touching the core commitment of the regime. This is why, for example, in Sierra Leone, I want you, you are lawyers, go and research. How many judges, how many cases in our Supreme Court has gone against the core commitment of a sitting regime? Take it from 1961 and come. If you meet two, then you are lucky. <laughs> but my research says none. Yet, we go there. And you see, you, will have, you now want to ask yourself, why then do some cases that are believed to be the interest of the regime go against the regime? Because you see, politicians are very strategic. They themselves do not want the courts to lose absolute power. They do not want the courts to be embarrassed all the time. Because the legitimacy of the court is important for them. There may be election coming. And there is a lot of rigging somewhere. And we want to come to this same judge to rule for us. We want the people to believe when they do so. So it is not everything we are going to interfere in. Sometimes the court can rule against us and say, <laughs> yes, that is fine. <laughs> Sometimes, it, in fact, it is the very politicians who will tell the judges rule against us. Because legitimacy is very important. If you do not have legitimacy, it's a waste of time. In the US, for example, the Supreme Court is everything. The Supreme Court is so powerful that they are the greatest lawmakers on earth. When the rule is finished, sometimes parliament has to run, run, run and change the law again, even to interpret that law where you have, you have to go. You come to the very Supreme Court. So it is important to all of us for us to continue to believe in judicial independence. But we have to understand that there are degrees of independence. If we are thinking that judicial independence is that which we are taught in law school, is that which we are taught in class one, to say there is a judge who sits down there and fairly determines issues between two people without any interference in all cases, then we are making a mistake. However, However, and this is the catch, we must understand that the judiciary is most important to all of us. As worse as the situation is, it is the next best thing. This lecture is not an attack on them. This lecture, that is why it has not even focused on Sierra Leone, it has just gone to other places. So you, you read between the lines. Apply. Is that not what we say in law application? <laughs> Apply. We have talked about Turkey, not so. We talked about Mexico, not so. We talked about Egypt. We talked about Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. And we have talked about Uwey Museveni. Very little has been said about us. So the purpose is not to attack anybody. The purpose as I always do with my lectures, is to open the minds of young people to challenge things. Because that is the only way you are going to be true lawyers. That is the only way you are going to be true politicians. If you understand things, you are ready to question them. Conventional legal teaching on judicial independence is flawed. It's wrong. It is not enough. You need to balance it with a political science perspective. And that is not taught in law school. So lawyers get frustrated. Since the day courts were created, every day you speak about lawyers, they are talking about judicial independence and getting themselves worried. But if you really understand what you are dealing with, you will be able to strategically plan and prepare yourself 
to face the real world, not the imaginary one. It does not mean that courts do not have their value in states like Sierra Leone. They do. They may, in fact, display independence in cases that may not threaten the core interests of the regime. There, may, there are many cases which the state is not interested in. There are many cases where the powerful don't even want to know anything. So the judges can flex their muscles as they want. The issues that the regime usually regards as its core commitment may be few and shifting over time. What is the core commitment of the system today may not be the core commitment of another system. This makes courts still very important and useful to citizens and does not serve the purpose of settling or adjudicating disputes between them, sometimes, if not most times, fairly. For instance, even with the criticism of the U.S. courts by several political scientists like Robert Dahl, as is being a part of the dominant political coalition fostering its key policies, it cannot be gainsaid that its policies display of independence is far above the courts in autocratic regimes and some countries like Turkey, Chile, Argentina, Nicaragua, Egypt, Sierra Leone, Nigeria. When the law says the judiciary is independent, it's useless. It is the principal guarantees that will help. It is the practical guarantees that will help. The constraints that will build, the limitation of the powers of the president towards them, the limitation of the judges themselves, their ability to take certain arbitrary actions, the level of monopoly they have, the level at which they can exercise discretion. Society has to control it. And it is only when we understand these things that we do not recklessly leave our faith in their hands, both the politicians and the judges. We will make sure we introduce policies that safeguard our interests as a people. We will make sure we have policies and programs that are not reckless. For us to say, oh no, remember Christian Atop used to say what? Go police. You do not want when politicians trample on your rights and you go towards them, they say go to the court. It may well be it's because they are aware that that is their core commitment and nothing will happen to it. It may happen in one case, but they will retaliate. And once they retaliate, they start purging the court, they start packing the court, they start changing the, the judges, they start transferring them to Kenya and Mo, and you don't see them in Freetown again for the rest of the year. <laughs> All of us are in trouble. Therefore, as lawyers, as political scientists, it does not matter who you are. All of you listening to me today, this is not an attack on judiciary. This is not meant to reduce the importance and significance of the judges. It is meant to open your minds to the reality of what faces us as lawyers. I will conclude by saying the courts are useful in maintaining law and order. Because you see, no matter what the case may be, when people fight, if you know that there is a court to go to, that is something you can sit down and wait for, not so? So that is an important function of courts, which we cannot underestimate. And also, we have to move towards making sure that our society is more pluralistic. Civil society has power, journalists have power, a bar association has power, religious bodies have power, and all of them can be able to reduce the power of the state. When power is not concentrated in the executive, when power is not concentrated in the political system, it is easy for us to have judicial independence at least to the degree of autonomy. But like I have told you, I never forget. The evidence is clear that whether in democracies or non-democracies, that true independence of courts is in fact a function of control by the regime. 
and judicial independence remains the figment of lawyers' imagination. I thank you all.